everyone. Thank you for joining us for AO Trauma North America's Orthopedic Trauma Journal Club series. Tonight, we will be discussing non-unions. Today, we're joined by uh, Dr. Bill Abramsky uh, from Vanderbilt, and we're going to be discussing his paper that was published in JOT in 2007, Plate Fixation of Femoral Non-Unions Over an Intramedullary Nail with Autogenous Bone Grafting. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Yeah, my pleasure. Would hope that you could start by telling us just a little bit about how this paper came about and where what the status of non-union uh, treatment was at the time. Yeah, so interesting that uh, sort of the idea for this came from a couple unique patients where that were clinical problems. Um, one was a young woman who had a big segmental defect, and we put the nail in her, and uh, and after put the nail in, it was really wobbly still, and so. Uh, it was a big open uh, injury and it was all exposed. And so at the time I just put a plate on it at the time to add additional stability because I knew I was going to come back and have to bone graft and I thought it wasn't wobbly. And so that was one of the first times sort of a scheduled non-union, so to speak. And then two others were one, a uh, Hispanic guy who had a nail, femoral nail, a cloverleaf nail put in in Mexico, uh, you know, 20 years ago and he was playing soccer and it was a non-union and it broke. And then we couldn't get it out. I mean, I couldn't get it out. And, and so I thought, well, I guess I can plate it. So then we just played it over that and, and, uh, and bone grafted him and he healed. And one more was a guy who got nailed in an outside institution and then, then came to us. And his start point for his femoral nail was so anterior. He actually had a gluteus medius injury, uh, you know, from his uh, nail insertion. And I didn't want to go digging around and the nail was sitting really anterior and he was a thick guy. And so uh, I just thought, well, I guess I can probably plate this. And, and those three cases were maybe the first three, I'm not even sure if they're in that series, but where we got the idea that, you know, maybe plating around a non-union, an exchange nail isn't always necessary. And so that was sort of the onset of the idea. So before you did this, do you want to just comment on what was going on in the literature and in orthopedics and what the traditional treatment would have been for similar non-unions? Yeah, so the the literature had been some controversy of whether or not a pure exchange nail was fine. And Larry Webb had sort of written an article, and I was in North Carolina at UNC at the time, and that an exchange nail had a very high success rate. I forget the number, 85, 90%. Um, but Carolina's Medical Center had published just down the road from Wake Forest uh, that their union rate with a pure exchange nail um, was only around 50%. And so the question was, did you need more biology, more bone graft? You needed to breed the non-union. It's still a little bit maybe controversial today. And I would say it may depend upon the non-union type and where it is, it's metadapacil or diapacil. Um, but I, I think those are some of the controversies at the time. Uh, and then these uh, isolated uh, sort of clinical scenarios came up where really questioned I wasn't able to do an exchange nail or didn't want to do an exchange nail. Uh, and so we just looked at other ways of attaining and maintaining stability, uh, as well as uh, the opportunity to add biology with a bone graft. Yeah. And I guess one of the concerns at the time would have been whether or not adding a plate would have compromised periosteal blood supply in addition to the endosteal from the, from the nail. Right. Yeah. It's always been the, uh, it, that was a theory. Uh, I think as we're, you know, learning that, uh, you know, the dual plate plate nail combinations, particularly in elderly patients, uh, maybe it's that the additional stability you gain may be worth the risk of uh, increased vascular insult. Yeah. Do you want to just go through, if you don't mind, the process of, of, how, you, uh, of how you went through the surgery then and, and maybe if you've changed it all, how you're going through it now? Yeah, well, it's, uh, it probably all depends on where the non-union is, whether it's a distal femur shaft or, uh, or a proximal femur, but, and whether or not you think you need to exchange the nail or not. Uh, and... Uh, and most of the time you can do this without exchanging the nail. Uh, and uh, when I'm not planning on exchanging the nail, I'll have the patient in the lateral position uh, and then do a subvastus uh, approach 
uh, for as long as you need to make it. Usually I would counsel you to make it as longer uh, is better, at least to expose, make sure you see the, the, uh, the arteries, uh, you know, the perforators before you cut them and you don't get one uh, while you're trying to stretch uh, and make sure you've got good control. Uh, and then you can get an adequate uh, debridement of the non-union site. Uh, and these are almost always atrophic or um, oligotrophic uh, non-unions. And you can debreed the site and then get bone graft from wherever. Uh, you know, in the lateral position, I, I think that the posterior crest, and many people are cautious. Uh, I think that Mike Bossy and the Atrium Group wrote a nice article. It's 4% chronic uh, pain. And, you know, people quote this uh, much higher percent, but I think if, if done correctly or uh, judiciously that the incidence of chronic pain is extraordinarily low. Uh, and so uh, I think it's a great reservoir for bone graft. So again, if you're just thinking through the process of just maintain the principles of exposure, debridement, biology and stability, that how you get there is probably less important uh, than maintaining some sort of, uh, making sure you hit all those bases. Yeah. There's some fractures, hypertrophic in particular, that you don't have to take down the non-union site? Well, it's probably a, depends on who you ask. Um, <laughs> I think that for me, the ones you don't have are the mid shaft, where maybe we put in a smaller nail. You know, we put in so many 10 nails. You know, 10 years ago, I put in nothing smaller than a 12 nail. Uh, and now we're tended minimal reaming and 10 nail. And that's fine, but it's maybe not if you're a six, six guy uh, who's, uh, you know, 250 pounds. Um, it, I think we've seen, I've seen a patient stand there and wobble his leg back and forth and say it moves and i'm like if i can hear it clicking so i think 10 nails are great most of the time but sometimes we may allow too much motion they get a hypertrophic non-union and those that are mid shaft and hypertrophic you can probably do a closed exchange nail uh, i would say that's 10 percent of the non-unions i see and that's a data-free opinion but it's a guess uh where i think if a non-union with a hypertrophic mid shaft where you have maybe an undersized nail that a pure closed exchange nailing is a reasonable idea. Yeah. If you're if you're taking down a non-union site in an atrophic non-union, do you find that if you leave that if you're working around an existing nail that you have difficulty getting enough compression at the at, um, where you've taken down the non-union site? Well, most of these non-unions are are not, you know, pure clean fracture lines, you know, like, like we see in oblique fractures acutely where you can get AFT reduction and uh, compression. They're much more undulating and irregular. And I think the critical thing is stability and maybe not, or you may even have a gap, you know, and then you're not really getting compression. I think the key thing to me is stability. And I, uh, and I work for uh, biology and stability and how you how you attain that and the compression in that manner i think is probably less important do you want to maybe just comment on your selection for when you're going to use a plate nail combo and when you're going to use a, a plate in isolation or whether you're going to just do an exchange nailing yeah so uh simplest first so exchange nail is uh probably i think as i said with a mid shaft hypertrophic uh nail where it's really trying to heal. And then I give the patient the option you can, I think that's one scenario where you could probably take out the interlocking bolts and allow some compression. And I, but on that, I think if you select the, I tell people it's about 50 to 75% effective, where a plate over that is probably 90% effective. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, when I would uh, do a, a plate nail combination are where, uh, you know, it's probably metadiaphyseal, um, where that uh, you, you uh, just an exchange nail doesn't really give you that much more stability. So uh, a plate nail combination, metadiaphyseal, either uh, more distal than proximal. Uh, and then um, a uh, plate only, uh, historically, that's all, you know, in my first 10 years of my training and practice, it pretty much was the standard answer. You said you were going to do a plate nail or an exchange nail on a metadiaphyseal, so you would be crucified. So I think we're learning uh, that as long as you stick to the principles, that it works. 
Uh, and so a plate only maybe around uh, when they have an implant, periprosthetics, of course, I think is a good example, uh, which uh, are relatively low event rate. And we're part of a prospective trial of looking at periprosthetic fractures. Uh, and uh, just and to maybe give you a better idea, give surgeons a better idea of what the event rate of that is. My guess is it's pretty high. So that may be the periprosthetics or where you have an implant in already, or you can't remove the implant, like, like uh, or you don't want to remove the implant from either it's in too far from the distal femur, it's a, a nail you don't, you can't get out, it gets stuck, uh, or uh, you can't, it, it's a clover, old clover leaf nail that were never designed to come out very well, or where you might just use a, uh, a uh, just a plate, those three, those three examples. Is anything you want to add before we wrap it up? Yeah, I would say anybody who's listening, uh, don't uh, hesitate to challenge the status quo and to ask good questions and to be innovative in, in your uh, in your thought process. That's how we get better. So uh, applaud Jeff for putting this together and uh, hope it was helpful and uh, keep thinking and making us better. Great. Thanks very much. All right. Thanks, Jeff.